To think that we can't make organisms that are more efficient than existing, I don't think is, is correct because nature doesn't have DNA laser printers and we do. Hi, I'm Zach Weissmuller for Reason TV. We are here with Austin Hines, CEO and founder of Cambrian Genomics, a company dedicated to making 3D printed DNA. Austin, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. Now, when you say 3D printed DNA, it conjures a certain image in my mind. What exactly happens when you print it off? Does, are you just printing off this like goo filled with DNA and, and what happens to it afterwards? I think 3D printing is a good analogy, a good way of understanding it. With 3D printing companies, you have one company like MakerBot and they actually sell printers that people have on their desktop. And then you have other companies like Shapeways where you send your design and then they will print something there and eventually send it to you. We're more of the Shapeways model. Uh, you're going to design it on your home computer but send it here and we're going to print out the DNA sequence. Unlike with Shapeways, we're not immediately going to send you your thing back in the mail. Uh, we're going to send it uh, somewhere else to be tested to see if it's safe. And once it's seen as safe and you're able to put enough money into it to get over the government hurdle, then you'll be able to actually get your, get your product. So what is that product? I mean, someone sends you uh, what kind of DNA they want and then you make it and you send them what? MakerBot, you would print out, say, like a plastic dinosaur, right? With Cambrian, the idea is eventually you'll be able to print out your own little dinosaur that actually walks across the table. Oh, what step uh, in that development process are you at now? What exactly do you produce here in this laboratory? Right now, we produce DNA for the largest pharmaceutical companies in the world, as well as partnering with plant companies Currently, Glowing Plant is a product for sale at glowingplant.com that glows in the dark. And we got that through the USDA and the EPA. You're gonna be able to get the seeds and grow it in your yard, uh, which, is, which is exciting. What your company has kind of brought to this process so far is you've dramatically brought the price point down. Could you talk about that and, and the role that robotics plays in that and the role that automation plays and your ability to bring that price point down? It's directly related to an, another phenomena that I think everyone's familiar with, It's just DNA sequencing. 15 years ago, no one got their genome sequenced because it cost $6 billion. It was a dollar a letter. That became super cheap because it became uh, made by a machine that could make and read uh, millions or billions of strands of DNA at a time, like the one sitting right there. We'll sequence uh, 400 million strands in a single run. What we did is we simply leveraged uh, sequencing technology to reduce the price of making DNA so that the cost now of making or writing DNA letters is the same cost as reading DNA letters. The idea that this power can eventually or very soon be in the hands of the masses uh, frighten some people yeah. and we saw some of that play out in your interaction with Kickstarter where you were raising funds for creating the glowing plants and Kickstarter banned any further GMO projects. Well, that, that will probably change, I imagine. It's a new technology, not a lot of people have familiarity with it. Our goal really will be to, to put this in the hands of, of everyone to not necessarily to make money, uh, but to to make this a more common thing. Huge percentage of what we eat already is, yeah. is GMO. There is a growing fear among certain segments of society and even people in government that uh, people will alter our environment, our ecosystem in ways that are unpredictable and possibly dangerous. Does that concern you when it comes to this kind of thing? Uh, yeah, so safety is a huge concern and security. To think that we can't make organisms that are more efficient than existing, I don't think is, is correct because nature doesn't have DNA laser printers and we do. And so we really need to, to build um, a system whereby the things that we create do not proliferate into the wild. And the way to do that is by changing the codon table. Like this is all protein or it's organized by protein. Protein is 20 amino acids. And so if we introduce artificial amino acids uh, into synthetic creatures and then we, there's no source of that in nature, that means they can't survive unless we're feeding them. 
if we're thinking this of this in terms of 3D printing, where essentially the the means of production are kind of brought way down and, and ownership is brought to the individual level even. How do you see that shifting the way science is done in America? Oh yeah, so virtualization is really going to take off. We see things like Oculus Rift and augmented reality, you know, the Ed Snowden robot from TED. And it's going to be almost like being there. And so you'll be able to go from idea to finished product without ever touching anything physical. And that's exciting because that's not how things work now. If you go to an academic lab, it's miserable. They're spending 90% of their time cutting and pasting DNA from different creatures that they collect from across the country and pasting them together. We want that to be 95% design analysis and 5% manual work, if there's any manual work. Your, your company has glowing plants that are uh, available for people to design and, and even purchase. One of your companies has even promoted a uh, probiotic that allows dog crap to smell like bananas. Yeah. So what is the relationship that you see there between um, consumerism and uh, science? Well, what's great is with consumer products is that they can be crowdfunded. So the plant, $5,000 investment, half a million in six weeks over a million revenue total since, since the onset. That means a couple people can get into the game with a tiny budget, a budget just large enough to make a video. And if there's interest, then they can use that money not only to print the DNA, but to make the organism and then pay for uh, the expense of lawyers and everything else to get it through the regulatory agencies. How do you feel generally about the regulatory environment of the biotech space? Do you feel like it's about right? Is it uh, too restrictive, too restrictive in certain areas? Or what's it's funny, you know, it's not. In the United States, we're pretty open on plants, but we're really locked down on people. Oh, yeah. Whereas you go to Europe and it's the opposite. They're really locked down on pl plants, but they're open on people. In the UK, they're having uh, three parent babies. In the near future, we're going to have lots and lots of people walk, you know, humans walking around Europe that are genetically modified, you know, genetically modified organisms. What's also funny is that many of those people are going to be a part of anti-GMO organizations. So you're likely going to have the president of some anti-GMO organization be a GMO. And so you'll have a genetically modified organism protesting the existence of genetically modified organisms, which is going to be really funny. In time, all of us will likely need to print out and fix our DNA. The issue with that is it's going to be unique. Our DNA is unique, unless you have an identical twin. Your DNA is unique, and it's wrong. Everyone's wrong. Everyone's messed up, and everyone needs to be fixed or will need to be fixed at some point. You'll either get cancer or some other disease. So. How do we do that given the current uh, regulatory environment with the FDA? The FDA doesn't approve things one off. They approve like a small molecule that you can give to everyone on earth. But everyone's unique and that model will no longer work. It's gonna be very, very uh, specific and very individual because now we have these tools that are very, very precise. I mean, with this machine, we can sequence a whole human genome in a single run. We can know all of your letters. With the machines in the other room, we can print out all of the letters. And so that power never existed before. And so regulation on the medical side of things is gonna to need to catch up to that. On a personal level, what uh, excites you most about what this technology allows us to do right now? Um, and looking forward in the next three to five years, what aspect kind of gets you the most uh, excited? We're getting really close to the point where we can not only know our code and all the code of everything that's alive on the planet, like Neo and the Matrix. It's all just, everything that's alive is just code. You know, all the food. 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have that. Now we do. Wouldn't it be more exciting if not only we could know what everything is, but sort of change it by snapping our fingers and reimagine an entirely new world around us where everything is programmable, everything is, is rewritable, everything can be modified, everything can be made better, and the individual has the power to do that. The individual has the power to know themselves like they've never known themselves before, to read their entire code. It really 
changes society, culture, religion, changes how we think about ourselves as humans, changes about how we think about the environment, changes how we think about our future and the purpose of life itself. It is extremely profound, but it all comes from something very simple, which is the cost per letter of DNA. Austin Hines, thank you very much for talking to us. Yeah. For Reason TV, I'm Zach Weissmuller.